Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It is great to see you all this morning. Man, if you're a guest this morning, we are excited that you are here. Welcome to Bridgewater. My name is Rich. I have the privilege to serve here as a campus pastor. We hope that you enjoy your time with us this morning. I'm going to try this again. First service, I tried this out, and no one was with me, so I'm going to try it again to see if I fail again. If you were born in the 80s, you really dig that bumper video. Yes? Is anybody here born in the 80s, grown up in the 80s? Could you get that? That's like totally Tron right there. O oh for 2. Man, i got to try something different next week. Anyways, it's great to have you with us. If you just go ahead and open your Bibles to Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6, we'll be starting at verse 1. If you grabbed a Bible on the way in, you will find it on page 625. Amos 6, verse 1, page 625. We are continuing our series called Stranger Stories. It's a a series when we're going back into the the Old Testament, look at some crazy narratives of these small books that actually show us how to live in real life situations today. Um, We'll be talking about how to deal with life when life is flipped upside down. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go to our podcast. I'm not sure if you know that we have a podcast or not, but every single one of our messages are recorded and put up on the web so you can connect with it any way you want. You can subscribe to it. You can find it at our Bridgewater app. You use Apple Podcasts or Google Play, but you can subscribe to it. You can download it. You can share it with your friends, whatever you want. But if you ever miss a Sunday, you can have it right there by Sunday afternoon. It'll be in your device, and you can catch up and follow along. But let me just start with something a little bit different this morning. I want to ask you a question. Um, What would you do if you suddenly became financially wealthy? I mean, you suddenly became financially wealthy. You didn't have to work anymore. You didn't have to worry about money anymore. It wasn't an issue. What would you do? Where would you go? Think about that for a minute. If you didn't have to work, you didn't have to do anything else for money. You just kind of could live and go and do whatever you wanted what would it be? Every year in my small group, I like to ask them at some point, if I give you a credit card and it's an all-expense vacation on me, zing, zing, you go wherever you want to go, where would you go? You should see their faces light up like, oh my word, like I actually had that kind of money. But they would think, and they're thinking, and like, oh my gosh, and you'd be really surprised what they would say, where they would go. I still get face, Facebook requests and ideas right now, say, Rich, this is where I want to go. I'm like, I asked that question three months ago. <laughs> you're still thinking about where you want to go on vacation. When you're in small group with this week, maybe that's how you kick off your small group. Start asking, say, hey, listen, small group leaders, I'm going to give you a credit card, and I'm not going to give you a credit card. Maybe use your own credit card. All pen- <laughs> Ask that. Where would you go? It's really fascinating to watch how people get excited and what they will do in life. So I want to take that idea and I want to expand it. I want to give you a credit card for life. Best church ever, right? (laughs) Credit card for life. What would you do? Zing, zing. Where would you go? How would you live? Some of us would, would buy bigger and better homes. Some of us would buy those cars that we've always wanted, those sports cars if you're in that midlife crisis stage, all right? Some of us would go, we go to the best golf courses around the country, around the world, and hack some holes around the world. Others of us love to hunt. So we've always wanted to go for that big game hunt that costs $10,000, we don't have the money, but now you do, so you're going to go hunting. Others, Others of us love to travel. So we want to jump on a cruise ship, and we're going to jump port to port all the way around the world somehow, some way, but that's what we're going to do. Some of us, we want to spoil our grandkids, so we're going to make sure our grandkids have whatever they want, when they want it. We're going to spoil the thunder out of them. And there's some of us, well, we're just going to choose to sleep in because that's what we'd really want in life is we'd really want to sleep in. (laughs) The reality is, If I gave you a credit card for life where we could do whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted, the reality is, my friends, that many of us would possibly be tempted to waste our lives. We would waste our lives. Now, before you call me a hater, get on your social media and say, the pastor says I'm wasting my life. Let me just change change the situation. 
Same situation, credit card for life. What are you going to do? But there's one added situation I want to bring in is this, is you only have one year to live. Credit card for life. You can do whatever you want, but you have only one year to live. How would you choose to live? What would you do? What would, you, what would matter most to you? Kind of a game changer, right? Kind of, I think when you start thinking about I only have a year to live, my mind and how I'm thinking or what I want to be doing might actually change. I believe that we become more passionate about what really matters in life. And when I say what matters, I mean what matters to God. Because if I'm going to stand before God at one point when it's over in one year, I'm, how I'm thinking, what I'm going to be doing is drastically going to be different. And I'm going to give an account for my life before him. What am I doing? How am I going to choose to live that one year? Because if it's me, I'm going to stand before God and I give an account for my life, the one who gave me life, one breathed life into my nostrils, the one who, who holds me together, sustains me right now, I might start thinking and acting differently. And I think you maybe start thinking and acting differently. I think the things, how we do some things at church, we may be doing and thinking and acting differently. We may, I may start thinking about how can I really invest in my boys? Invest in my boys during this one year so they, they have a strengthened, deepened relationship with God that will never let go. They may spend less time on my couch in my pajamas, which I was doing yesterday, hanging out watching TV, and actually go outside and connect with my neighbor a little bit more. Or my coworkers, or your classmates, or people that you're connected in your circles of influence. How we live might change if we had one year to live and we stood before an almighty God and had to give account for our lives. Now, Here's the reality. We shouldn't need a death sentence to want to make our lives count. We shouldn't. As a church, eternity should drive its way through every aspect of what we think or what we do because we know it's coming. We know eternity is coming. It's coming not just for me, not for you, but for all humanity. And if it's in the balance that if people we care about right now, if all life to end, would they be separated from God for all eternity or to tie together with him for all eternity? Let me switch this around a little bit. Some may not know this, but the church is a, is a living organism. We function as a body. The church is not this building. It's you and I and everyone who has said yes to Jesus Christ. We are a living organism. And just like living organism right now, every living organism and some people, we get sick. Phil mentioned about the flu, the stomach bug. Some people are not here this morning because they're home and they're sick. Maybe it's been through your family and you're like, oh my word, I don't want to ever come back because it was that bad you were sick. Well, that also happens to the church. The church gets sick. A disease enters and it doesn't function like it should. A disease enters and it's not as productive as it should be. And so I think about the church, the the living body of Christ here is, is one of the biggest, most destructive diseases that a church can get is complacency. Complacency. Being okay with the status quo. Like, we're just going to go through life and, and everything is just going to be okay. And so this morning, I want to dig into that idea. I want to dig into this idea by looking at a guy named Amos, a blue-collared farmer who was called by God to go into a nation that rejected him and his message. And he proclaimed an awesome message to God, to God's people to start living for God's purposes. Amos is a very interesting book. If you were to read it, and I encourage you to read it this afternoon, it's only nine chapters long, you would think when you read it that God's got an anger issue. Like, dude, you got some problems. But when you read it and understand why he's angry you'd get it. Because as you read through it, you understand that his chosen people were completely complacent in life, that they had no need for him any longer. 
the one who provided them everything. They're like, yeah, we're okay. In fact, during the time of Amos, God's chosen people, the nation was broke up in two different kingdoms. They couldn't get along themselves. There was a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. And they each had their own kings. And during that time, these kings, uh, was it Uzziah in, the, in, Ju- in Judah? And it was King uh, Jeroboam II in Israel. And these kings set the stage, bring stability into their kingdoms. They were very prosperous. They're growing economically, growing with their land. And they were bringing stability into a situation that didn't have it before. But there's a difference between these two kingdoms. Judah, Uzziah, lived for the Lord. It means he led his kingdom to honor God with their lives. Jeroboam II did not. In fact, he lived completely opposite. On the outside, they looked like everything was going great. But God saw deep into the heart of that kingdom and saw a rot that he despised. So God sent Amos up into Israel and to proclaim some really harsh truths to a spiritually diseased people. Chapter 4, verse 12, you see on the screen it says this. He says, prepare to meet your God. Like you are living in such a uh, negative way, in a way that doesn't honor God. Your end is coming. Chapter 5, verse 21, it says, I hate I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. This is God talking to God's people. And then you get to chapter 6, where he calls them out on the carpet. In chapter 1, he says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and you who feel secure in Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation, to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Cana. Look at it. Go from there to the great Hamath. Then go down to Gath, the Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near the reign of terror. Verse 4 says, You lie on beds adorned with ivory, lounge on your couches. You drink choice wine and lambs and, and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. There was a corruption in their nation and they didn't care. They were complacent with what they had and where they were in life. They were at a point where they had no need for God. And they started worshiping other gods. Hosea, another prophet, said that you were spiritual adulterers. You were cheating on the one and true God with these false gods. They turned on their backs against the very one who gave them everything. Because they were secure in their position and their prosperity of their land. Now for a country that was founded on through the relationship with God. Friends, that is a dangerous place to be. See, God warned them far before this took place that he was going to bring destruction. In fact, we're doing a reading plan right now, reading through the Bible, and I hit Deuteronomy 8 this past week. It will not be on the screen, but I want to share it with you So you get an idea of why God was so angered with his people. This is Moses speaking to to the people. He says, chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Be careful that you not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you to this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, you have all what you have will be multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you forget the Lord your God. You will become very, very prosperous where you're at, and you will forget about me. And then God goes on and says, this is what I've done for you. And it goes down a little bit further in verse 17. says, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength and my hands have produced this wealth for me. God had nothing to do with the prosperity of this land. I did it by myself because we have no need for God. 
Verse 19, it says at the end, it says, If you forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. This is before they even entered the promised land. They're going to the place that God promised to give them. where They, they were told they, will, they would prosper. It's a beautiful land, and I'm going to take care of you, my people, but be careful when all this prosperity is happening around you. Don't fall in the trick of forgetting that I was a part of it. You become proud to think it was all you and you have no need for me. That is why God is so angry with his people. And so when I stop to think through what God is saying to his chosen nation, the kingdom of Israel, I can't help to think what he might say to America. What he might say to our country. Now, to be clear here, the United States of America is not God's chosen nation. I might just sort of burst some of your bubbles who stand and say, I love my country. But as I read through this book from front, front to back, we're not mentioned, friends. We're not God's chosen nation. But here's the truth. Our country was founded on God and in his principles that are found in this book. It is weaved through the very fabric of the principles of our Constitution, and everything about us is founded on God. It's on our money, and God we trust. When you say a pledge of allegiance to the flag, it's one nation under God. And we, too, are a very prosperous nation. There are things you can find in our country you can't find anywhere else in this world. The luxuries. People see what we have, see pictures or hear about what we have. They're like, oh, my word. They have houses for their cars. I can't believe they have houses for their cars. They can't even put the cars in the car houses because they have so much stuff in the car houses, the cars have to sit outside. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Meanwhile, we live in a 12 by 12 hut with a dirt floor with my extended family. You thought in-laws were hard here. One room. And I share that because I believe we're getting to the point in our country where we're saying we have no need for God because we have everything we need because we're prosperous. So what do we do? What do we do? If God were to show up at our homes in a burning bush to have a conversation with you and I, his church, what would he say? I think he'd say something like this. Don't settle for complacency. Don't settle for complacency, complacency, meteorocracy. Complacency is settling for what is average. When it comes to God, that's offensive because nothing about God is average. Nothing about his word, his church, his world, his creation, his promised life. Nothing about that is average. God wants his people to have an ambition, not an ambition to promote themselves or positions or prosperity, but all about promoting what is right, right in his eyes, what matters most in his eyes, which is people coming to know Jesus and having a deeper relationship and becoming more like Jesus. That's what God is. He wants us to be discontent, not for what we don't have, but discontent for what we're seeing in our nation, in our own community, how they're saying, this is the way life is. This is how it's going to be. He says, no. It's not what I've called you to be. It's not what I've called you to do. When I think about this, I go back to this, uh, the story that Jesus tells in Matthew 25 called the parable of the talents, the parable of the gold, bags of gold. And Jesus tells a story about this master who gives out bags of gold. And he gives one guy five bags of gold. And that guy goes and multiplies that and he brings back and he has ten bags of gold. And then he gives another guy, he gives him two bags of gold. And he, that guy goes and he multiplies it and he brings back, he has four bags of gold. And he says to these two guys, the master says, well done, my good and faithful servants. Well, then there's another guy. The third guy is given one bag. 
And he does nothing. He actually takes his bag and hides it. And when the master comes back, he pulls it out and says, look, I've given you this one bag, the bag that you gave me. I'm giving it back to you. And the master looks, look at this, chapter 25, verse 26. You wicked and lazy servant. When I hear about that story, if I read it, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Wait a second. This guy was not an addict. He didn't take that bag of gold and buy his drugs and buy his alcohol. He didn't go do that. He wasn't a thief. He didn't take the money and run. He wasn't about making himself uncomfortable and, you know, being materialistic and like, make it rain. You know, he wasn't doing anything like that. So what's the problem? We look at at stories like that in the Bible and we think, okay, this guy did nothing wrong. But he also did nothing right. That, my friends, is complacency. God gave him the opportunity to do something, but he chose to do nothing. John Stuart Mill says it this way the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And right now, in many ways, in our nation, Evil is triumph because God's people are choosing to do nothing. We can't settle for what culture is dictating. We can't. We can't just sit back and watch it happen and because we're at a place in life where we're comfortable and we don't want to get uncomfortable and face the realities of what's right in front of us. We can't, for that fact, get complacent in our own walk with God. We should never be. We should be pursuing him. Churches all across America are closing every single day because they see what culture is doing and they give up and give in. Like, you know, we can't fake that anymore. There's too much. There's just too much going on, so we're just going to shut our doors. Churches across America to this day are twisting the Scripture to be relevant to the culture. Say, we want to make you happy. We want to make you happy. We want to make you happy. So we're going to spin this in a way to make you all happy. That's not what God desires. Our nation is very prosperous. But we are very much like Israel. There is a rot in the core of what's going on And that, my friends, is a stench to God. We need to fight back. We need to figure out and start fighting by living the light of Jesus in a dark world. And then we courageously pursue the future hope now. Courageously pursue the future hope now. That is, that is being a man or a woman who's willing to stand in the gap between the world, where the world is and where God desires it to be. And we stand in the middle and we're willing to proclaim the resolution, the solution to the problem, which is Jesus. Because that's exactly what Amos did. He left Judah, went up into the northern Israel, and he proclaimed the message. They didn't want them him there. Look, what he, look how they responded. Verse 12 of chapter 7, it says, Then Amaziah, was a priest of, his, of Israel, said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Get out. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't come here prophesying the, at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Get out of here, you punk. Your message is not for us. Go back to your own little country. Notice what they said. This sanctuary is in temple of the kingdom. It's a king's. It had nothing to do with God. It was all about man. And it goes on, and Amos says, I was neither a prophet or a son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd. I also took care of some sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people in Israel. Then now hear the word of the Lord. And you say, don't prophesy against Israel. Stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. God was taking an ordinary man and sending him to do an extraordinary thing. 
And that's what God is still doing. Choosing ordinary people to accomplish his extraordinary purposes. And friends, that's you and I. We're ordinary people called to do extraordinary things for Christ. Blue-collared workers. We have two options. We can see what's going on in the culture and let it go and be complacent in our lives and let the dying world get darker, or we can stand like Amos and fight and speak the truth that there is hope in Christ. Courageous, being courageous is an absence of fear. It's caring about what you're proclaiming so much more than what you're afraid of. Being courageous is not from who you are or where you came from, but it's understanding who stands with you. The God of almighty things is behind of what you're saying. That is being courageous. And when I say pursue our future hope now, as a church, we understand that one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to set everything new back the way it was in the beginning. No death, no disease, no sorrow, no pain. That day is coming. But until that day comes, we are called to bring the light of hope in the kingdom of this world. Think about the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus was teaching his people to pray, he said, pray like this in Matthew 6. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, his kingdom, eternal kingdom is coming, but until then we have to have this idea that we want to bring some of that kingdom truths, the light of hope to the world around us. Just as like God's on his throne and everything is glorious in heaven now, we want to bring that down and shine a little bit of that hope in front of our people. We're called to be a church that turns the world upside down with the truth. The early church knew this. The early church was known for this. Acts chapter 17, verse 5, they're out talking about Jesus, sharing the message of hope, talking about the gospel. And then look what they respond. They said, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Those people who are telling everybody about Jesus have shown up in our land. They've shown up in our community. They showed up in Tonkanic. And they're telling everybody about this Jesus and it's turning everything we know about upside down. That's the church. That's what we're called to do. And to say nothing is truly saying something. Because sometimes our silence is our approval. I know that every single person in this room has someone in their life that does not have a relationship with Jesus. If life was to end now, they'd be separated from the Creator for all eternity. To say nothing is saying, okay, I'm okay with that. But are you really okay with that? We have people in our lives that are just hanging by a thread. They're confused right now because they've tried everything the world has to offer. Do this and you'll be happy. Do this and you'll be prosperous. Do this. This is the real life. Do this. And they feel so empty, alone, have nothing inside. And they're absolutely confused. They understand, I have done it all. Why? Because they bought into the lie. And they haven't had someone who is courageous enough to walk up and tell them the truth. You can't find fulfillment in the world. You only find what you need in Jesus. So who will speak for God? Who will speak for God? Who will be willing to stand in the gap? Will it be you? Will it be me? Will it be this church? Think about one way you can stand in the gap this week and proclaim the message of hope. Talk to someone about Jesus. Invite them to come to church. Invite them to your small groups. Say, listen, man, I get together once a week with these people and we do life together. 
I don't understand everything. I don't get everything. But, you know, we come together and we walk through these things that make a difference. And I walk away for fresh. Maybe you invite them to a small group. Maybe it's just simply grabbing those invite cards and inviting them to come to church. Take them to your classmates. Take them to work. Bring them in. Talk about it. What is one way you can stand in the gap? Because that's what we've been called to do. And turn the world upside down with hope. Because right now we live in a nation. We live in a country, a community that is missing hope. Find it and live it. Now, let me just share with you a word of warning. When you stand and you say, I will be in the gap for you, God. I will not be complacent in life. I will be courageous for you. When I'm going to stand in the middle, be ready. Be ready. Be ready to, for God to do more than you can ask or imagine. Friends, we serve a mighty God, a big God, a massive God, and we come to him with our, a little saying, this is what I want to accomplish, God. It's like, no, 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 I want you to accomplish up here. So be ready. He's going to give you influence in places you never thought were possible. He's going to network people in your life that you never saw coming. He's going to use our kids. So many times our children are so much more bold in their relationship with God, and they're taking those invite cards to school by the boatloads, and they're like, here, come to church, come to church. They're inviting machines, and they want to pack your cars and bring them to church or the student ministry. They want to bring them back Sunday night. Be ready, because if you truly stand in the gap, when God's people start aligning their lives, living organism of light, lining their lives with, God starts doing the impossible. What we thought was impossible, God starts showing up in ways we never saw coming. And we stand like Amos in a culture that rejects the messenger and the message. We don't care. We will get rejected. There will be pushback. We'll be said, get out of here, punk. We don't need your Jesus. Yeah, yes, you do. Yes, you do. And I love you that much that I'm going to tell you. Do not let our silence be an approval from someone we know or connected with in any way be separated from God forever. We are the church. That is our mission. Now here's the thing. In two weeks, we're going to be four years old. I four years old, right? And I'm very humbled to say that we have never been a complacent church. Every single one of you have been stepping out, inviting, and doing the mission of Christ, and that humbles me. But this message, this conversation needs to happen for one reason only. So we will never be a complacent church. That we see a community of people that need the hope of Jesus, and we will stand in the gap no matter what the cost. Are you with me? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. Father, you are amazing in every way. And sometimes, God, it takes a heavy hand by you to open our eyes. You surely show that truth to Israel and Judah, how they're choosing not to live for you. God, thank you for using their apathy, their complacency to show us and open our eyes of what you call us to do as a church. Please let us not be silent. Please let us not be afraid. Show us how to be courageous for you. Show us how we can open up 
the eyes of our own community, our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates, to the hope of Jesus. Don't let the prosperity of our own country become a barrier from the mission that you've called your church to do. Let us be a light in a world of darkness. For your glory, I pray. Amen.